Greetings, it's Terry at Cottage in the Court. I don't know about you, but I'm having the strangest winter ever. I'm wondering if some of my plants that I really haven't cut back yet, I'm protecting our little good friends underground, I wonder if they're going to survive. I wonder if we're going to get snow. I wonder if when we do get the snow, we'll my hydrangea buds get nipped by the cold weather. I wonder a lot of things right now. But the good news is, I know that the bulbs will survive because they're underground, nestled in, putting down their roots, and ready to make their grand entrance. Speaking of survival, what a time we're having right now in the world. We are going to survive this. And as we survive this, I think we're going to garden even more. I wrote about this on my blog, Cottage in the Court, and I hope you read it. I want to introduce or reintroduce to some of you one of our local garden leaders, Kathy Jentz, Washington Gardener Magazine. I'm sure you've heard of her. Well, Kathy and I took a little bit of time after attending a conference recently, caught up, shared a few things, and I'll let you in on a secret. Well, not right now. Anyway, let me introduce you to Kathy Jens. Good afternoon, Kathy Jens. How are you? How are you? Well, happy new year. Yes. 2021 it's here <laughs> finally, we finally were waiting we were waiting right it was like <laughs> we need to usher her in with grandeur yes <laughs> oh, Kathy. Never, yeah i was gonna say there was never a new year that had so much hype <laughs> Besides you all it's pr you know. right yeah exactly <laughs> so kathy um for those that don't know and those that are outside of the dmv or the mid-atlantic who are you So I call myself a garden communicator, first and foremost. So I have my fingers in a lot of pies, so to speak. And I would say my main thing uh, that I do when you boil it all down is turning black thumbs to green. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the best way to phrase it. I try to do a little bit of hand holding, a little bit of coaching. I do garden speaking, garden writing. I published Washington Gardener magazine for the greater DC mid-Atlantic area. And let me pull up for those who can see visuals, maybe I can pull up a back issue to show. Um, and for those who are listening, they can just go to WashingtonGardener.com. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of our back issues on shade. So a lot of specialization on small space gardening, on beginner gardeners and on urban. So and anybody close in or inside the beltway who has a lot of different pressures and challenges for gardening that we are very familiar with. How'd you get started on this garden journey? So I am the child of lifelong gardeners and farmers. So on my dad's side of the family, they're in Northern Indiana, Northwest Indiana. And my grandfather had a big farm. When I came along, he was getting rid of the dairy cows and the chickens and just Mm -hmm. concentrating on corn and apple orchard he had. And he had a market stand that we would sell out of when we stayed there in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Um, So it would be me and my brother and I would be like nose deep into, you know, Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew mysteries. (laughs) (laughs) And people would pull up into my grandfather's long driveway all the way past all the the apple orchard and they would be like i like a, po- a pound of green beans and i'd be like put down the book <laughs> weigh out the green beans put them in their thing <laughs> oh wow so i was like not that involved in the growing part we we helped a little bit on the summer times but i think we were more uh, a nuisance than a help <laughs> so <laughs> But on my mom's side of the family, they're in um, Bayreuth, outside of Bayreuth, Germany. Um, mm-hmm. I was born in Nuremberg, and I was an army brat. That's how that happened. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. uh, my grandparents over there had a lifelong allotment. So in Europe, their community garden is called an allotment. 
and it's usually a 99 year lease and their community gardens are set up a bit differently than here in general they're like a quarter acre or half acre sized piece of land uh -huh. and you get to plant fruit trees and have they had their own cistern and well on the property they had their own little um cabin or garden shed mm -hmm. and people set up barbecues and they basically spend most of their weekends there when it's you know decent weather for doing so so it's kind of almost like your little away place from the city mm -hmm. so that was a, probably my first introduction to more urban gardening and mm -hmm. more intensive gardening from the food side of things but my grandma my german grandmother over there she had tons of ornamentals so that she was growing you know big uh rows of tulips to cut and bring back into uh their apartment in the city and of course they had just a uh, open lawn for playing in which grandkids loved as well hmm. that's a background that's for sure <laughs> so it's, it's, it's in your dna as well then yes and i would say that my parents when we were moving around as army brats you know you had to establish a garden where you could so you know sometimes you were somewhere 18 months sometimes you were somewhere six months and i was switching schools all the time and i do remember my parents had little community garden plots and this is back in the 70s and there was no water sources we had to haul our own water and milk jugs to these community gardens and I was not a fan of gardening because that's what gardening meant to me <laughs> was hauling heavy water in the su hot summertime <laughs> to, oh, wow. to water plots. I, I mean, I certainly enjoyed the benefits of the gardening, you know, mm -hmm. a fresh watermelon or, or corn or something else. But I was like, this work is for the birds. <laughs> and now as a mature adult. Yeah, so I'm I'm willing to do the work, but I've learned my lessons. <laughs> I've learned mm -hmm. how to, and I'm certainly willing to pass those on and how we can make it a lot less work, um, not having to haul all that water, not having to do so much weeding and maintenance. Um, and of course, it all starts with great soil. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. Great soil is true. So tell me more about the magazine. How did you give birth to this wonderful magazine? So I'm a journalism graduate from University of Maryland, mm -hmm. and I specialized in magazine and feature writing mm -hmm. um, just because I knew I didn't want to be a newspaper reporter and I wanted to do more long form writing. And I'm one of those people who is always up in everybody else's business. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm like, hmm, what's your story and what's behind that? And I like to really do deep dives and dig really in. Mm -hmm. um so that's what got me into journalism and my first jobs out of college were for local uh headquarters of, of national and international associations oh. so running and fitness was one school supply industry was another and practical nursing was another so you get to learn a lot about each of those industries and you're producing the publications for them you're attending their conventions and helping out with board meetings so that gave me a lot of good background on publishing and of course starting their websites and running their e-newsletters and that sort of thing mm -hmm. but at a certain point i was like i need to work for myself <laughs> just uh, i just face my own personality and know that i could work for other associations in a series of associations and do their publications but it wasn't my passion mm -hmm. i love doing the publications but you know that wasn't practical nursing or running a fitness that wasn't what I was personally into. Meanwhile, I had bought my first condo and it was a walkout like garden style condo. And I had taken over not just my like 15 by 20 patio, but the common area outside of that. And then I was spreading out even further. <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> that's when I was like, I think I need to buy uh, something with some space to garden in. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting my hands slapped by the condo board. They were like, uh, Kathy, that's not yours to garden. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, at that same time that I was looking for a home with gardening space, that's when I was looking for what can I do to pursue my passion in publications. And that's when I started to look around and say, you know, there's not really that much great information for home gardeners in the greater DC area. There's mm -hmm. all these great sources, like the USDA is in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, we have incredible public gardens. We have the Smithsonian, we have all this here, 
but at that time there wasn't that much outreach to the home gardener and getting putting that all in one source for them so that's when i was like oh this is the niche i can fill is bridging that maybe scientific research that's behind the scenes here and translating that for the home gardener and how long has the magazine been around our first issue was march 2005 so we just passed our 15th anniversary and I had planned a big 15th anniversary party last March. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'm going to just store up everything for a big maybe 20th uh, or something like that. Because yeah. yeah, with COVID-19 and uh, the running closures and things, I think it's just better that, you know, we'll do something big for the 20th. Blame it on Rona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, did you attend Mance this week? First of all, share with my, my listeners, what is Mance? What is Mance? M-A-N-T-S, so it sounds like it has a Z, but M-A-N-T-S, Mid-Atlantic Nursery Trade Show. So, mm -hmm. it's for the horticultural trade, um, so you're supposed to be a professional in the industry, and I say supposed to be because, you know, a few people sneak in there who might not be in business. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but they're but they're such plant nerds that they have to get a little you know get a little curious and see what's in there. And the garden media, of course, like Terry and I, are invited to preview and and walk the floor. And normally it's the entire Baltimore Convention Center. Mm -hmm. um, this year, of course, because of COVID, uh, they had to go virtual. So it was over a three day period. They they tried to replicate everything as best as possible as far as the exhibit hall and the same timing and same events. Um, but what they added on to the virtual, which I really enjoyed, were several presentations by mm -hmm. plant breeders mm -hmm. and uh, some of the wholesalers you got to talk and meet in person. And a lot of these are, companies are international. So it was really fun talking over the Zoom or it was a Facebook Live or um, other interface with a breeder in Ireland who maybe we would never meet or have over at the Mance show. So mm -hmm. that was really cool. Mm -hmm. So all this virtual madness, um, including at Mance, because I enjoyed it as well. Um, is it is it here to stay or is it yeah. going to be a part of the future? I think it's going to be a meld. I think we can take the best of what we had the past year mm -hmm. and realize, like we said, that we can have more crossover with some of our international partners, you know, mm -hmm. people who might not be able to afford the travel to an event. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of, of shows like the California Spring Plant Trials mm -hmm. that I always want to go to every year mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Garden Media is invited, but that's a week in the middle of spring when everything is happening here. And I'm like, even if I could afford to go and take that week off, it would just be insane uh, to be leaving all the stuff that I have to do here at the same time. But I could see, you know, somebody walking through with a camera and doing a Facebook Live and showing you the spring trials, mm -hmm. um, kind of doing a hybrid. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that so that maybe there would be uh, like a registration for online mm -hmm. that would be at a discounted rate and then in person is a different rate. And then there's a hybrid of part in person, part online. Mm -hmm. that, that could probably work too. And that would attract a lot more people, I would think, to a lot mm -hmm. of events. Do you think that with Mance being online this year, do you think more people were able to attend? Mm -hmm. I think so. I don't know that they did. Certainly mm -hmm. more people could have had access I don't know. I'm going to um, talk to their press people in the next week or so, and I want to interview a few of the exhibitors afterwards to see if their orders that came in during and after the show mm -hmm. were on par with a in-person event. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly opened it up to people. And I think a lot of people registered, but mm -hmm. the other factor that's not, you know, COVID related was the international news and what happened in DC yeah. at the same time as Mance. Uh, drew a lot of people's attention away. So if you were like freaked out and sitting in front of the TV watching current events, you probably missed some of those exhibit hours. But I did find out this morning 
that the exhibit hours and booths will stay up for 90 days, I believe they said afterwards. Yes, yes, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, yeah. <laughs> I was worried about that, that they might not only leave it up for like 30 days or so, because there was a lot of exhibits and talks and things that I didn't get to. Right. That they were simultaneous. And I was like, I'm only one person, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's my dilemma too, mm -hmm. with all of this virtual madness. When things that you really want to see are offered at the same time, it's yep. like, you know, I'm going to miss, and it's not worth going to half of one or half of the other. Mm -hmm. So Which I'm I, glad I that you found that out. And also I've done the, I don't know if you have signed up for like an online Zoom session, and then you had another meeting and I'll have it on my cell phone. I'll have Zoom going on one device and I'm like, oh, this is not working. <laughs> like I tried to multitask, but it's not working. But that yeah. is uh, actually a good thing to point out as a, a attribute of being online is because there's been a lot of conferences like our GardenCom annual meeting mm -hmm. where there's three or five speakers Mm -hmm. all in the hall at the same time and you have to pick which room and they're not recording the other sessions mm -hmm. and you just have to rely on talking to a friend of yours to say okay I sat in on the one on speaking skills and you sat on the one on accounting can we swap what tips we learned mm -hmm. but the fact that it's all virtual now and now it's all recorded so mm -hmm. you can go back you might not be able to do it live and ask the speaker the questions live, but mm -hmm. at least you were able to watch the recording of it that you might have missed. And see, I, even though you wouldn't be live, the, mm -hmm. to me, the advantage of that is building relationships. Yep. So you might not have had the ability to ask that speaker at that presentation. Call them up, send them yep. an email, connect with them. It helps cultivate a bigger and broader community. Now you mentioned garden calm, beg yep. pardon? I said, I like that word cultivate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Now you mentioned garden calm. Mm -hmm. Tell my listeners, what is garden calm? We know, because yes. we're members. <laughs> Please, come on. And I'm wearing, for those who can see, I'm wearing my old GWA shirt. So <laughs> garden calm was GWA, the Garden Writers Association. Mm -hmm. And for years, people were saying, well, we're a photographer, we're an editor, we're a PR person. So we changed names to be more reflective of the membership. So it's garden com as in garden communicators. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit shortened there. So that's open to anyone in the world um, who is either currently uh, in the profession or aspiring to it. There is a student level membership that's, that's a nominal fee. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there and you're like, I'm going to start a blog or I'm thinking about changing careers. Maybe you're a school teacher now, or maybe you own a nursery and you want to transition. Um, think about that, you know, think about joining at the student level and then proceeding up to the professional level. So it's, it's a big mix of membership. I, I don't envy our garden com um, leaders, which I'm a national director <laughs> and the board, because it's so hard to do programming that hits a bunch of us because we're right. all different. We're, mm -hmm. some, we're coming from so different backgrounds, like some are professional journalism backgrounds like myself. Mm -hmm. Some, as I said, are like nursery owners or landscape designers who said, well, I need a newsletter to send to my clients and customers. So I'm starting a newsletter and that's how they got into guard communicating. Or maybe they came from a background like they they were a home gardener and just fell in love with gardening and wanted to start a blog or a radio show or a podcast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we have all these different various backgrounds and all these various different needs. So mm -hmm. try to uh, service as many of those as possible. But basically it's a professional association to build up the skills in the industry and to get out the word to what the general public, hey, we exist. Right, <laughs> right, right. Get out the word on gardening too. Right. I look at GardenCom as uh, a flower bed. Mm -hmm. And the, our vendors, the people that we connect with, they are the seeds. And it's a, an environment, this, this, all those two, those two things, the perfect bed, the perfect vendors, help us cultivate a community of gardens, garden writers, garden communicators, photographers, um, videographers, uh, even uh, Instagrammers, mm -hmm. all kinds of social media. If you're in the industry as a professional, 
it's one of the places you might want to consider joining. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there's like we're the we're kind of the mouthpiece of the horticultural gardening industry for the public. Mm -hmm. But we're also a lot of us business to business. Right. So if you're a plant breeder or wholesaler looking to be going into nurseries or going into garden centers, there's also that segment of the industry. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. many layered, many, many layered. Many, many. And most many. of us have slash titles, meaning uh, like myself and you, Terry, we're writer slash photographer slash blogger slash podcaster. Um, very few of us wear only one hat. Right, right. You forgot the planaholic it. part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we all have that part in common. Hopefully we yes. all have that part in common is yes. a love of gardening or houseplants or just one segment of it. But mm -hmm. hopefully we all have that in common. Well, I'll tell you, one of my favorites from this week of everything was sensational lavender. I can't wait. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I can't wait. What was one of your favorites? I think I'm really excited about this new Delphinium Del Genius. It's not the easiest name. Right. So the series is called Del Genius. And we in the Mid-Atlantic area, we pine after Delphiniums. Yes. So we see them in Northern gardens and in British gardening shows. And they just melt in our heat and humidity. Yeah. Uh, but the Del Genius series was trialed last year for the first time in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. And it was still blooming and doing great through July and August, which mm -hmm. is incredible. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to try those out. Yeah. 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 We, we have our favorites. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about Garden Calm. We've talked about Mance. We've talked about the magazine. Um, Community gardening. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a member of Fiesta Place Community Gardens, and we're we're uh, we're growing up this year. That's a, a little signal. But what's going on in your community garden? So I'm a member of the Fenton Street Community Garden, which is diagonal from my house. I'm on a corner, and it's the opposite diagonal corner, and that's not by accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I moved in here, it was a uh, um, plumbing and a AC business. Um, and so she, I knew she was selling in a few years and it would be park property. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if there was a community garden on that park property and not just a corner park that people just walk through on their way to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Cause it's, it's, it's not very big. It's maybe an acre or so it's, uh -huh. but it's 44 plots. My plot is 10 by 20. So mm -hmm. most of the plots there are 10 feet wide by 20 feet long, which sounds small until you have to work it yourself. Yeah, amen. <laughs> so, yeah. and we all are very intensive gardening. Like mm -hmm. I, I noticed, I, I think we're, I don't want to call it um, miserly, but the pathways that are between our plots, we have nice pathways that go down lengthwise mm -hmm. down the whole rows. They're nice wide three foot that we can put our wheelbarrow and water and stuff down. Mm -hmm. But between each of our little plots, <laughs> <laughs> you, I can barely put my toes in between <laughs> Wow! because we keep expanding and expanding. I was like, well, there used to be a path at least a foot wide between the two of us that we would maintain. I'm like, we're not doing that anymore. Right. <laughs> right. Expanding right. and expanding. Uh, inch but by you inch. don't have to weed as much, right? Yep. <laughs> but yeah, we're like crazy for even more space. But then the, there are some plots in our community garden that are 20 by 20. And mostly those are couples or families. Mm -hmm. Those are a lot of work. I've noticed that mm -hmm. a lot of those are the ones that turn over the quickest mm -hmm. uh, because people realize at the end of the season that that was a lot of weeding work. That was a lot to maintain. And mm -hmm. of course, we have the blessing of full sun, mm -hmm. which is great early in the season. But by the time you get to midsummer, you're looking for some shade <laughs> and, or you're out there early or late. But of course, that's what makes a great veggie plot is as much sun as you can get. Right, right. Are you growing anything new in your plot this year? The one thing I think I'm going to be growing this year new is I was thinking about doing a trial of um, some of the there's a radish that came out from Botanical Interest that's specifically for the seed pod. Yeah. And I let some of my radishes last year go to flower and seed and harvested the seed pods. And those were good. 
but then this one is specifically for that purpose of not the radish itself but for the seed pod mm -hmm. so that looks pretty cool and i was trying to think of what do you think i was trying to think of some other things that i might grow this year that i've never grown before and usually if i haven't grown something it's because i don't eat it mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'm like that's not going to be worth the effort mm -hmm. um to grow it but i will set aside more space this year for cutting flowers yeah because um, i noticed last year i kind of set more aside for growing um watermelons i had many icebox watermelons mm -hmm. and then i had squashes and that takes up a lot of real estate even though yeah. they were mini and meant for urban growing they're still a three by three plant right and i gave a lot of space to cucumbers as well and i was like you know what i missed last year was armfuls of cutting garden flowers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the the ones that you did plant last year of cut of cutting garden flowers, mm -hmm. do any of them self sow? Yeah, the borage usually self sows. Mm -hmm. I have that in a lower corner area, so mm -hmm. I let it spill out onto the pathway. And the one thing that comes back every year, and all my neighbors neighboring plots have bunches of it now, is celosia. Mm -hmm. and it's like a red candle fire solution yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I'm always, I always laugh when I get a new neighbor that hasn't been there the year before and I have to warn them and I'm like you're gonna get a bunch of this spiky flower coming up in that corner and you might want it you might not want it it's easy enough to pull the babies right but yeah that is the most prolific reseeder for me is that celosia yeah. candle fire and you know, it used, well, maybe that cultivar, but Celosia in the past, like growing, when I was growing up as a kid, it didn't self seed. Mm -hmm. I'm a native Washingtonian. All of a sudden now, yep. it does. Something about it. And then I will have to warn people who, who bring it in as a cut flower and then let it dry in the vase. Yes. It looks great. It looks great. You can either have it like that coxcomb look or like that flame flower that uh, species we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But Usually what happens after a month or so, it's inside and you brush by the vase where it's in and then you have hundreds of black BBs falling down <laughs> and you're like, where did all this come from? And I'm like, oh, I forgot that the seeds are drying in it and that I should have put a piece of newspaper or something underneath to capture a bunch of those seeds. But yeah, it does make a mess. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. If, if you have enough, uh, I like to put vases of flowers mm -hmm. in the midst of, um, you know, any type of green house plant. Mm -hmm. I can put that vase of celosia on a pie pan and no yep. one sees it but me. Good idea. And that way it catches the seeds. Yeah. yeah. I've taken to putting like little coasters underneath, but that's not enough. No, <laughs> no, no. Not enough. <laughs> you want something to capture those yep. seeds and then just throw them out. It makes, mm -hmm. a, um, I'm curious, I was trying to separate some celosia uh, a couple months ago. And um, I was doing well, and then Precious came, and uh oh, it, yeah. So <laughs> I took those seeds and and I threw them out, and I'm like, that's going to be Precious's cut flower garden. So I'm really mm -hmm. curious to see what's going to come up, you know. Yeah, and what the that's, is. that's part of the surprise of gardening is you never know what's going to reseed. What it's also if it was a hybrid. So maybe that Celosia was an F1 hybrid that I was trialing and might revert back to one of its mom or dad plants mm -hmm. or might come true. You never know, but it's always an experiment and you can pull it out and replace it if, if it's not something you like, but I can't imagine it's Celosia. Come on. It, I know, I know. It's like, <laughs> what Celosia can you not love? So <laughs> yeah, I was it's say, January. Like yep. Yeah, January. Mm -hmm. And normally, in a couple of weeks, I would have signed up to volunteer to help you with the seed swap. Mm -hmm. Tell us about National Seed Swap Day and what's going on with it this year. Yeah, so I um, started hosting a local seed exchange with Washington Gardener Magazine um, shortly after we started the magazine because I wanted something in the winter time to get readers together. So I was like, what do we need to do in the winter? And I was like, ah, oh, well, we need to start our tomato and pepper seeds to give us a little head start on the growing season. And then I thought midwinter is perfect for it. So I had the last Saturday of January uh, officially named National Seed Swap Day. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, if I had to do it over again, I think I would have dropped the national part. It's just seed swap day. <laughs> so <laughs> everywhere, whoever wants to participate, totally open and fine with me. Um, so every year since then, we've had a local seed swap. And for the last about, I think, eight years, we've been hosting it at Brookside Gardens on that Saturday. And then the following Saturday on the opposite end of the Beltway, uh, we do it at Green Spring Gardens in Fairfax County, Virginia. And due to COVID this year, um, they are only allowed 10 people in a room and that would include our staff and volunteers. So that's not gonna work <laughs> for a seed swap or seed exchange. But what we've done is we've rescheduled it to early spring. Um, so we'll be at Green Spring Gardens on March 27th and Brookside Gardens on April, I think it's 4th. I think it's the Saturday before Easter. Mm -hmm. um, and we might change the programming. Obviously protocols will be changed as far as how many people can come in at a time. Uh, probably still be wearing masks at that point. I'm hoping a lot of us have the vaccine at that point and we can have at least 25 to 50, but we're thinking at both locations, we might do something like have two shifts, like uh, a 12 noon and a 2 p.m. come through, um, depending again on how many people are allowed in the room at the same time, if we have to split into shifts or not. But um, because the last Saturday of January is still seed swap day, I'm going to host a live I think it's going to be a Facebook live session mm -hmm. and I'll be posting that link out soon and that's going to be open to anybody in the world I think I'll have it flow onto YouTube and a couple other channels as well and that will be just an open session to talk about seed swapping how you can host a local one how you can set one up by mail order um, this past year, I've been experimenting with putting seeds out in little free libraries and mm -hmm. other locations where people can pick up and have a contact free exchange, because mm -hmm. um, obviously we want to be super careful. Mm -hmm. um, probably there's not going to be any cross infection by that, but, you know, we want to be as careful as possible. Right. Now that, that's a novel idea. That day is not going to go into the hinterlands. We will nope. still be learning. So what about the educational programming that you had? Because that was always awesome to me. Yeah, we always had some great featured speakers. So, and the reason we even had speakers in the first place is because that's when we were sorting the seeds by category, the volunteers. <laughs> so it gave mm -hmm. us a breathing room while people were watching somebody talk about how to propagate seeds or how to collect seeds from native plants. Um, so we've always had great speakers. So that will probably be part of the Saturday free program mm -hmm. um, that we do on Seed Swap Day itself. I think for the local seed exchanges that I host, I don't think we're going to be able to have speakers on site uh, because gathering everybody up in the room and talking to them might not work. But mm -hmm. again, we'll have that, that free recorded um, presentations available for them. And if we can have speakers, if all of a sudden they say you can have 50 or 100 people in the room, yay, <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll add them back in. Right. Hmm. So all is not lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. So thing. keep saving, keep packing those seeds. I have a sunroom full of seeds uh, that are not packed or labeled <laughs> <laughs> that are just collect, like I just went out and cut off all the dill seed heads in my garden and put them in a big brown grocery bag and put dill on the side. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I guess I need to spend some winter nights counting and packing and sorting those out. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the beauty of it, if, if we want to find some beauty in the midst of COVID, take some time like you just said, go through your seeds from last year, see what you have so that you're ready for the mm -hmm. seed plot. Yeah. Because let's be honest, in a packet of, of let's just say tomato seeds, you're gonna get like 20 seeds. You're not planting 20 of all one tomato. You're gonna have excess. Instead of letting it go to waste, mm -hmm. share it at the seed swap. Mm -hmm. You know, it just makes sense. What other, give me two tips that you wanna share with seasoned gardeners and new gardeners, because we had a lot of newbies last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great to see so many people are interested in growing their own food for various reasons. So I would say grow something new, like we talked about earlier, try out something new every year in your plot, because it can kind of get routine. You're like, I always grow that one type of tomato. I always grow this one type of radish, but try what some of the new varieties that are on the market. Experiment a little. You might find something cool and new that you like 
and, you know, do a little at a time. Don't try to do it all at once, which we all, as beginners, we went through that phase <laughs> where we tried to like do everything at once. It's better to establish one bed at a time, get that going, do another bed and then another, or just little bites every weekend or just a couple hour project, you know, you don't have to come in sore with a sore back every, every weekend right. and fall into bed. Right. So I remember when I used to work full time for associations outside and come in and I would curse the setting sun because I would be <laughs> like, I only have 15 minutes or so to get out there in the garden and the sun would be setting on me. And there was all that, the jokes about, um, gardeners wearing headlamps, you know, for mining out there in the garden. <laughs> Terry says she was one of those. Yep. I do that. So yeah, take it easy on yourself, you know, be gentle with yourself. But I would say, and also for the more seasoned gardeners, uh, you know, take another gardener under your wing. There yes. are lots of people in your life who are just completely flummoxed, who it's a big, you know, subject to address all at once. You're like, do I fertilize? Do I water? Blah, blah, blah. And it's not that complicated, but it seems complicated from the outside looking in. Right. You know, like a lot of new ventures, you know, the first time you sat in the driver's seat of a car, you're like freaking out. Like, <laughs> what do you do? But yeah, so it's not that complicated once you get started. So, you know, take in a, um, maybe a neighbor, a coworker, a uh, online friend who might be a first time gardener, give share some seeds with them and maybe some seedlings as well. That's another good thing to you know, you started, uh, like you said, you don't need a tray full of tomato seedlings. And that was great to see on the, our online local neighborhood lists, mm -hmm. like next door. And we have um, local community association lists. Somebody would say, I have a tray of big boys tomato seedlings mm -hmm. and uh, I'll put them out on my front porch and everybody can grab one who comes by or something like that. Beautiful. Gardeners share because we realize and recognize the beauty of connecting in community. Mm -hmm. no. So, in abundance, yeah. Yeah, in abundance. Any other words you want to share? Anything new, exciting coming up? Well, some of the things we saw at Mance, besides new plants, which we're always focused on the plant part, right? <laughs> we're like obsessed with the plants. <laughs> so, a couple of the products that we saw, one was called Sea Bite like bite an apple. Um, that was a kind of cool system for making your own garden trellis and adjusting and making different sizes. So mm -hmm. I'm eager to try some of those out. Um, but I would say, you know, stick to the basics, as we said at the beginning, good soil. So focus on getting your soil in good shape and everything else will go from there. So if you have not good soil, nothing's going to grow. <laughs> not nothing, okay. but you're going to get a not very good harvest if you're if you're uh, a food gardener or herb gardener and even for cut flowers but um i was gonna say i do a lot of gardening in containers so that's one way you can control your soil almost a hundred percent that so if you don't have great soil in your home um, say it was really compacted or years of neglect or whatever Start with containers because that gives you a, a easy, quick success where you can control all the potting mix that's in there and you don't have to dig out and remediate mm -hmm. the soil. Meanwhile, while you're working on beds for a couple of years, then plant into them. Now, what do you do with your soil that's in your containers? Mm -hmm. What do you do at the end of the season with that soil? So it depends on what I grew in the container. Some of it, I will compost it. But, I, you know, obviously, if it was, say, a tomato and it had a um, uh, blight issue, some type of disease issue, then I am going to get rid of that soil. I don't want that back in my garden. Right. Um, but I'll recycle it by adding it as an activator to my compost pile in, most of the time. And then if it, I use large containers, like usually three foot wide by three foot high type big containers, mm -hmm. I'll scoop out the top third and replace that because... Mm -hmm. I don't want to call myself a lazy gardener, but I'll just call myself a low maintenance gardener. <laughs> so you can replace all the soil every year for a fresh start. Um, but when you have huge, large containers, I think the top third is mainly where the root zone is going to be for plants. So that's really all you need to do. Mm -hmm. I take my uh, soil from containers 
um, I'm on a third of an acre. So I throw it in the back 40 mm -hmm. and I don't think about it. And yep. I've been here 16 years. Oh, you talk about some good compost because I let the leaves fall on top of it. Oh. But I'm always experimenting. And then I, I borrow people's grass clippings. They never know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way to borrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, borrow because I'm giving back to my garden at least, at least yep. um, from what I'm the compost that I'm making from it. Mm -hmm. So, Kathy, I want to say thank you. Um, uh, Kathy is national director for GardenCom, and I'm region two director for GardenCom. Uh, and we invite anyone that's listening, if you're considering uh, becoming a garden professional, if you are a garden professional communicator, come on and join us. It's, we have a great time. Um, we're looking for people that really want to grow with us, you know, uh, and that want to become a positive part of, of the growth of GardenCom. Uh, any last words, Kathy? Wait a minute. Wait, mm -hmm. Kathy, really? Tell me about your, bio, your podcast. <laughs> come yeah, on now. That's, a, that's so funny about... Um talking on other podcasts about podcasts it gets very insular right yeah. <laughs> that's when we do like guest blogs on other blogs too so yeah I have a podcast I started last March um conveniently at the beginning of COVID <laughs> it, of us did. it gave me all of a sudden garden events and and tours and things were canceled so I had a couple hours extra a week and I was like finally I can start the podcast that I've had notes of you know a big notebook full of notes ready to go um so it's like yes so it's called garden dc and it's an interview format podcast um similar to yours terry so i try to talk to um local garden hort folks or um keep it generally mid-atlantic focused mm -hmm. um although people from outside the region of course could listen and, and get something so we've had episodes on specific plants so or just one on pawpaws just everything you need to know about growing pawpaws and then some on concepts so like carolyn mullet all about garden touring so and we're always looking for new guests and you know reach out to me and if you're interested give me a give me a shout and it's garden dc all one word and what are your other social media handles so on Twitter and Instagram, I'm WDC Gardener and Gardener, E-N-E-R, because <laughs> I do notice a lot of people forget that that first E because they're used to the last name Gardener. Um, so Gardener. Um, and on Facebook, you can find me at Washington Gardener Magazine or under my name, Kathy Jentz, J-E-N-T-Z. Same thing on LinkedIn and YouTube. Our YouTube channel is Washington Gardener Magazine. And website washingtongardener.com or washingtongardener.blogspot.com so right or just google me thank you thank you thank you kathy gents for taking a little time out to chat with me for being supportive and for just being a gardener that we know in the DMV and beyond. You know, when I think about the gardening community, I, I picture a huge mammoth sunflower head. And as that sunflower head dries, the seeds pop out. There are no two seeds alike. Each seed will grow a sunflower that will be different than the next. The diversity in the world of gardening is something that I hope we embrace more so that we can collectively be a community that sets an example for the rest of the world. I normally would share a poem, but some words came to my mind when I wrote my last blog post, and I just wanted to read them to you because it's really from my heart. The garden encourages each of us to embrace a bit of the earth. Our gardens can provide food for our physical health. The garden provides food for our mental health. To garden is to unknowingly sip 
an elixir provided by the earth. Survival is a seed we plant in our life gardens and water from the goblet of faith. As the seed grows, we learn lessons from the garden which help us become survivors. We've endured a lot the past year and we're still here. Let's all mask up, glove up if you have to, shield up if you want to. If you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for the gardener that's next to you. I want to see you when it's time for us to gather and when it's safe for us to gather. In the meantime, stay tuned. Gardens and Plants will return. That's Peggy Riccio and Cottage in the Court. Where we chat about gardens, that we visit our own gardens, what's happening, what's going on, and anything new that we'd like to share that's relevant to the gardening experience. I ask that you follow me, my website, cottageinthecourt.com, Instagram and Twitter, Cottage in Court, Pinterest, Cottage in the Court, and I occasionally write on Medium. Enjoy this week. Can you believe it's almost the end of January? Get your seeds ready. I'm sure there's a seed swap near you. Enjoy. Enjoy.